Good morning, everybody. While you guys get our slides up here, um, I'll get started. My name's John Sockell. I am COO of a company called Limbix, and we create virtual reality. Now, Jamin and Carrie asked me to talk about what it's like to create a VR company today. But I thought even before we get into that, I'd do a show of hands. How many people in this room have actually tried VR? Woo! Great, that's a really high number. I don't think I've seen something so high. I think it's the San Francisco effect or the tech and the anxiety tech effect. So what we uh, do is we create a virtual reality platform for the treatment of mental health disorders. Um, now, I should let you all know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a technology entrepreneur, and I've got a real passion for creating products that go to underserved areas. And today we're gonna to talk about how VR is being used to treat mental health disorders. We're gonna talk about some considerations when creating technologies for healthcare. And we're even gonna learn a little bit about what it's like to create VR. Should we get started? All right. So VR is a really interesting tool where we've seen in the last 20 years over 285 peer-reviewed studies show that VR can play a meaningful role in disorders like addiction, anxiety, phobias, trauma. And so it's a pretty exciting time. In addition to that, why, why start a VR company? Well, we saw all this research, and then we, had, we saw a few other macro factors. Things like that the price point on VR hardware coming down a lot in the last few years. We've seen the interest in mental health services go up as the stigma has dropped conferences like this, uh, and we've seen the need for value-based care uh, being demanded more and more. And so with that premise in mind, we've created a team of psychologists, research scientists, engineers from places like Oculus or Google Daydream to build this VR technology so we could provide it to mental health. And you might be wondering, if VR is such a good tool for treating these disorders, how come it isn't until just now that it's in healthcare? None of us have probably really seen VR when we go to a clinic or to the hospital. And the reality is, is that the technology's really changed a lot in the last decade or so. It wasn't long ago in my lifetime where VR was a cave where you had six walls and a cube around you. And it takes eight computers to run something like this. And as you uh, and it would sort of create these experiences where you feel like you're somewhere else. And now today, we can put those experiences into handheld devices that go on your face. And as you turn, the world will update in real time. And that's what creates a sense of presence, and there's some really interesting applications for using that in mental health. And so a year ago, my company launched a product for exposure therapy for private practice. Now, are anybody in this room familiar with exposure therapy? Wow! <laughs> Uh, anxiety tech. Uh, so, <laughs> so I did not expect that many hands. Uh, so exposure therapy at a high level is the idea of systematically desensitizing ones uh, to their fears or sources of distress. And VR is a really interesting tool for that. And so we put a product out a year ago that lets psychologists see what a patient sees in VR on that tablet you're seeing and then control the virtual world for the patient. And VR is particularly, I think the best thing you could do, let's say, if you were afraid to fly, would be to take off and land 100 times in a row. And that's totally impractical, certainly not cost effective, and you're not going to do that in a therapy room. And so what we've seen is that it's a great way to practice this sort of thing. I could say the same thing for driving. 9% of uh, car accident survivors develop PTSD. And a good chunk of those folks will actually have a really hard time getting back behind the wheel. It might be a slippery road that triggers them. It could be a bridge, a tunnel, some dark area where they can't see well. And so what we've been able to find is that patients can get a lot better by doing these sort of exposure therapies. And this is a little anecdote uh, from uh, a story about a 19-year-old who did give his permission for this to be shared. And this 19-year-old uh, had never gotten on a plane, was really afraid to fly. And his family was doing 
a big retreat get together where they're going to bring in folks from all around the globe. And so his family was like, oh, how are we going to get this person onto the plane? So they heard about uh, VR and they found a psychologist in San Francisco who uses Limbix. And this patient would actually go see the psychologist over several sessions. And by the end of their treatment, this patient was taking off and landing in a fighter jet plane. And so when it came time to actually get on the plane, he was realizing that most of what he was afraid of was the idea of flying, not so much anything else. And so this actually, I love this outcome study because he actually went on this trip and met all of his family members. So I thought that was great. Now, I've told you a little bit about how we create virtual reality experiences, and you already know about exposure therapy. Uh, so I wanted to also show you another example. And this is public speaking in a boardroom. And you'd be surprised, a lot of folks get really nervous when they're public speaking, like me. And so we have this boardroom environment where um, on the left side you're seeing uh, some people being a little judgmental. And on the right side, you're seeing a control center. And the control center is what a therapist would be clicking. And the therapist might say, oh, let's make the audience be positive. Or let's make the audience be negative. Or let's, and we record this a few different ways, let's have them wearing suits and formal attire. Or let's have them look like they work in the Bay Area. And uh, so we, we try that out. And it just so happens, I don't have of scene for larger conferences and keynote talks. And so we're going to run a little experiment here where I'm going to hope that all of you can engage in and we're going to try recording two different ways. And I'm going to ask you to be uh, actors for a second. Now, if any of you are uncomfortable with this, I should first let you know this will likely be throwaway footage. I'm going to tell you about this camera in a second. So probably not going to make it into our product. But if it does, you're well and welcome to find me afterwards. I'm happy to blur out any faces. But I don't think it's going to end up making it in. But we're going to give it a try anyway. So looking at the camera, not me, this is going to be tough. I want everybody here to be fully engaged and positive and happy and really being warm to this speaker here who's afraid to get in front of this audience. And as you look at this camera, I should tell you, there are six lenses that go all the way around it. And these six lenses are fish-eyed, and they capture the world more or less around. Then there's software that will run behind the scenes afterwards to stitch together the edges of every one of these cameras. And then at the end of that, we put that footage onto our platform, and we splice it up in a way that allows the therapist to control so that when they want a positive audience, this engaged audience that's looking right at this camera right now, we can select it. And then at the, uh, or, or, or uh, something else. So as we keep looking at this in camera, we're engaged. I want to now give a big round of applause to this speaking phobic right in front of me. Let's, let's give him a warm round of applause. Oh, that's great. Nice job. Think we can do the opposite together? Let's get all of our laughs out of the way right now. I want you to put on your mean face. Let's go look into this camera and let's scowl. This is incredibly boring. I would love to be anywhere else but here. Maybe this is a great time to pull my phone out. I've been buzzing in my pocket the last few minutes and I haven't been checking it. I might as well see if that email was important. Maybe I need to check a text message. Maybe my neighbor needs to be whispered to because there's really nothing interesting coming on stage right now. I'm looking at my neighbor, I'm bored. Gosh, how much longer is this awkward guy on stage gonna keep going? I think that's good. Great job, Eric. Thank you for participating in that fun little experiment. We'll go back and give it a shot, but we'll have to properly do this one day. Now, exposure therapy, I think, is the tip of the iceberg for virtual reality. We have just talked about three exposure therapy examples. We did a public speaking one together, driving and flying. But 
when Jamon and Carrie asked me to speak, they wanted me to talk a little bit about what are the implications like when you're building a company and fundraising and things like that and things you have to keep in mind. And if you need, uh, so exposure therapy, even for the most active therapists, is something they're not going to do with their patients that often. They might only use it with some of their patients some of the time. And if you're creating a product here for the technologists in the room, you know it has to be really relevant to the typical ways that people work. So what we've been thinking heavily about at our team is what are other roles that VR can play? And one theme that sticks in my mind is addiction and substance abuse. As many of you know, the opiate epidemic is rampant. Roughly 60,000 people will die every year from opiate or opiate-related um, problems. And I was thinking about that stat. In the Vietnam War, there was roughly 60,000 Americans that died in the 10 plus years of occupation. So more are dying per year from this problem than a war that we were engaged in many years ago. It's also, when I think about substance abuse and addiction, something that's a little personal in my family. And I'm going to tell a story I haven't actually told to a group before. So in the mid-2000s, my father was uh, diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's non lung lymphoma. And he's alive, so it's not one of those stories. But um, when he was in his treatment, his doctor prescribed opiates to help him deal with the pain management. He was going through chemo. and It was a really painful, hard experience for him. And it helped. And it worked. And there's a reason why these drugs are actually approved and in use today. But unfortunately, it didn't take long for him to become hooked on it. And before you know it, he was trying to refill these prescriptions as best as you can. And by the end of 2006, he was checking into a Betty Ford clinic because he had gone way too far deep and he needed to come off of these drugs. And one of the most painful experiences for an addict is withdrawal. And when you're withdrawing, you're sweating, you've got fevers, you're shivering. It's not a fun experience from the looks of it. And pain is in the brain. And I don't think that VR is a substitute, but I do think that there's a role that VR can play to distract our brains and have it think about something else other than the throbbing I might be feeling inside. So we've been thinking heavily about what are the types of engaging experiences that we could create that could make someone going through chemo a little, much, little less in pain? And we've seen this being used in hospitals today. Some hospitals are starting to use VR during their infusions with patients. I think that's a really exciting thing. Maybe this is a pathway towards a little less of some of these uh, you know, problems. Another role we've been thinking about under this sort of theme of addiction and substance abuse is the idea of skills training. So when do you think the most likely time a patient is to relapse if they've been in treatment for a substance abuse problem? Any guesses in the audience? It's the first week when they're out. And when you come out of treatment, you go back to the environment where you typically, where, where that problem began. Maybe it's if you're an alcoholic, the local bar, and there are situations there to say, I'm just gonna get one, one drink real quick on my way home. Or maybe it's something else, like going back to your home. So we have a teleportation way we can use VR to go to any address on Google Street View. What's it gonna be like when we go back to these locations? And so what we've been thinking a lot is, what are skills that we could train people on while they're in treatment? So while you're in treatment, there's, there, you're having a lot of time with clinicians, but there's things you need to reinforce. And VR is a great mechanism for learning. And so what we've been thinking about is, how can we use VR to teach mindfulness, teach meditations, do relaxation, diaphragmatic breathing, skills that I could actually take when I'm out of treatment? What's it gonna be like when I go back to my home? What's it gonna be like when I see the triggers that caused my addiction in the first place? And these are some exciting ways that VR can be a new tool in the therapist toolkit. 
the last sort of way I've been thinking about VR beyond exposure therapy is for education. And for folks, it sounds like a lot of you are familiar with CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. You probably know that education is a big part of it, psychoeducation and learning about your disorder, what's going on inside your body, why your brain's working certain ways and some of the underlying causes, and maybe even why evolutionarily it was adaptive. There's a caveman picture. Um, so the idea here with education is I want to reinforce learnings that your therapists are telling. And when you think about how hard it is to get access to therapists, for those who are familiar with mental health clinics, a lot of times you might wait three, six months to get treatment. Are there things we can do to give you a stopgap in between so that by the time you do see that clinician, your time is spent much more valuably? So those are a few ideas I have for VR and some of the ways that Limbix is trying to build some of this for uh, mental health. But in the last six months, I've also learned a lot. And we've run a two-year-old company. But in the last six months, I've learned a lot about healthcare delivery. And you saw uh, my first slide, an example of, our, of a smartphone-based VR system, which is something that we're eventually going to be having to move on from. Because when we go into healthcare clinics, we've learned a lot of things about what it's like to build a product that goes into the workflows. So we're customizing our devices so that they're not consumer VR, but they have medical grade materials that could be wiped with, with alcohol wipes so you can keep things sanitized. We might do, we have things like custom straps that are made of plastic, not Velcro. Velcro attracts a lot of germs and it can be a problem in a healthcare environment. You have to think about charging and storage. Where are you going to be putting these things? Are there firewalls or Wi-Fi or connectivity issues? Can you build a technology solution to work offline? These are things that we've been working really hard on at Limbix as we try to think about how we can make technology that integrates into care. And so for anyone curious, we have a table out there with a couple of my colleagues with some of a, a new VR kit that we're going to roll out at the end of the year for mental health care. Uh, this isn't actually on the market, so it's a great way to try something that's only invaded with a handful of psychologists and mental health clinics today. So, and it should be a lot of fun. I got a couple of my team members here with me as well. Um, and so we can share with you a little bit about what it's like uh, specifically building the product. I've got my product manager here, as well as a director of, uh, of research who's gonna, who can also talk about some of the things we do to study these things, run validation, and make sure that we're building evidence-based tools for the places that we go. That's all I have for you today. If there's any questions, you're welcome to find me or afterwards, but uh, thanks so much for your time.